The topic that was given to me is the latest and greatest in Parkinson research. I kind of, to make it more relevant to us, I modified the title and added a phrase, going on in our neighborhood. So these are the clinical research, clinical trials going on at the Cleveland Clinic. So it's right at your neighborhood. So um, it's, it's over 200 years now since our hero, James Parkinson, first described Parkinson's disease. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the cure yet, but we know a lot more about Parkinson's now. We know that dopamine or the lack of dopamine is central to Parkinson's, but we also know that it's not simply a dopamine story. Otherwise, the cinemat that most of you are on should take care of it, right? But it takes care of it a little, but not enough. And so there's more to it than dopamine. We also know that it's not simply a neurological illness, right? It affects nearly every organ system in the body, from the skin to the eyes, to the muscles, to the bones, urinary, GI tract, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we have reason to be optimistic because we now have several symptomatic treatments. In fact, there are 24 FDA approved drugs for Parkinson's disease. And we have several FDA approved surgical treatments for Parkinson's disease nowadays, which wasn't available really when I was in training, learning how to treat patients with Parkinson's disease. So there is the holy grail we haven't reached yet, but we're getting close. Now, I want to start my talk with a message of hope. This is a slide that um, I've been showing for about 15 years now. This is a 15-year-old slide. And what I wanted to showcase here, so that's this, this bullseye thing. There's phase one, and going closer to the bullseye, phase two, phase three, and then marketed product. Um, and every dot is a drug that 15 years ago we were studying. And 15 years ago it was robust, and now they're available. And that, those dots, they're even more now. They're double. And so there's a lot going on. And not one center, even our center, could study everything. So we have to choose and pick which ones we can do, okay? Um, because we, have, we don't have infinite resources to it. And so how do we choose and pick which one we want to do? Well, it's a bit um, more deliberate, thankfully. So next slide. So what I wanted to focus on, we're doing maybe two dozen clinical trials or clinical projects in Parkinson's disease. And, but there's only so much you can, you can do. And so I want to focus for this talk, the research that's going on at our center that addresses the greatest needs by Parkinson patients, the greatest gap, knowledge gaps we have. The first one, number one, the sky blue there, obviously, is finding the cure. We want the cure. And so we are doing research now to try to slow disease progression, slow or stop disease progression in Parkinson's. The second one is one of the biggest burden in a Parkinson patient is when they start falling, right? It's so scary when you freeze, when your foot gets stuck, and when you're falling a lot. So is there anything we can do to stop or prevent freezing and falling? So that's a second unmet need. The third area is thankfully an area where we have options, but despite all our options, 
in the game, you saw like all these drugs, all these things we can do, it's still not enough. One of the biggest burdens, uh, burdensome features in Parkinson patient is that the duration of effect of their drugs, they're not predictable and they're not long enough. You simply want things to connect from dose to dose and even that seems very hard for a lot of our Parkinson patients. So a more predictable and connected dosing is a very desired unmet need as of now. And then the last, the one in yellow over there, the number four unmet need is, are, are the spectrum of non-motor symptoms. As you know, Parkinson's disease is still defined by the tremor, the stiffness, the slowness, the shuffling, or what we call the motor symptoms. But there's more to it than that, right? Thinking, emotions, pooping, <laughs> peeing, uh, they're all involved. So all these non-motor features are just as devastating as the motor features. And what do we have to kind of start that? So let's start with the first one. Is there anything we're doing that slows disease progression in Parkinson's? So this is the sad news. This is a tombstone of the drugs, not the people, but the drugs. We have invested, unfortunately, millions, hundreds, and millions of dollars trying to find a drug that can slow or stop disease progression. To this date, I posted there at least 12 that I personally studied in three decades of my scientific career, and all of them were negative. Didn't work, okay? So what keeps me going? Like, why do I think the 13th drug or the 14th drug is going to be different. Well, there is a reason for me to be optimistic, and I want to share this with you. Next slide. So we now know because of genetics. Genetics to us is a new window for possible success, finally. So the first gene mutation that we um, discovered, we meaning not me, but the scientific community, is this alpha-synuclein gene. Um, and we then discovered that these Lewy bodies that Dr. Walter showed, these Lewy bodies, they're teeming with misfolded or abnormal alpha-synuclein. And because of that, we were able to develop a stain to see how they start and how they progress. And so now we know it starts lower in the brainstem and then they spread, next slide, uh, I mean next, and they spread until it goes all the way all over the brain. Okay, so now that we can follow the alpha-synuclein, we can then arrest the progression. And maybe if we arrest the progression, we can slow, if not stop, the disease, okay? So this is the kind of, that's the alpha-synuclein. It uh, goes, spreads through the branches of the nerve body. We call them the axons. And, and it spreads to the next nerve and then it spreads and until it spreads all over. If we can cut that vicious cycle, then maybe it'll stop spreading, and if it stops spreading, maybe it'll stop Parkinson's. So now there are these alpha-synuclein compounds that inhibit or stop the progression. So there are two that we're doing now. There's one called the Padova. It's an alpha-synuclein inhibitor. And then there's another one uh, called the Orchestra study, uh, also an alpha-synuclein inhibitor. And we're saying, I don't know which one's going to work. Well, why don't we just do both so that whoever wins, we've studied and we can offer to our patients. So we're doing those, these two right now. 
So Padova next uh, is an intravenous kind of, it delivered intravenously. So it goes directly to the bloodstream. So hopefully that's deemed more effective. The other one is orally administered. For those a little shy and some blood sticks, then we have an orally administered for you. So these are for patients with early Parkinson's disease. Uh, for, for the orchestra study, the oral one, you can't have taken medications yet. For the Padova study, you should be on stable medication for three years or less, not more. Okay, so, so unfortunately, so we have those restrictions, but hopefully when we show that it slows disease progression and it's marketed, assuming your insurance pays for it, when we can now make it available for everyone. Okay, there's another one um, because of a gene mutation discovery. You know, the most common genetic mutation for Parkinson's nowadays is this LARC2 mutation. Uh, depending on what area in the world you live in, it's on, it's on chromosome 12, just in case you weren't sure where it is. There's a mutation in this LARC2. It's producing in more than it should be. And depending on what area of the world you are and your ethnicity, you have a higher chance of having this LARC2 mutation compared to others. It's highest among our Northern African um, uh, patients. Nearly 40% of them have LARC2 mutation. It's second highest amongst those with Ashkenazi Jewish inheritance. About 20% of them have um, LARC2 mutation. It's also high in Asia, some parts of Asia and Europe and North America, and sometimes it's very low, like only one or two percent. Nonetheless, this is an important step because LARC2 um, disrupts the lysosomal function in the cell body. What is this lysosome? Lysosome is kind of our clearing system in the cell so that it kind of poops out the debris um, of, of, uh, of its functioning. And so if that's disrupted, then the cell body is constipated, so to speak. And if they're constipated, and it's very toxic to the brain. Okay, so if we make that, we regulate that. Hi, Lark Chad, two, how are you? Who is that? LARC2 a little bit better, then we may have a chance of slowing disease progression. So next slide. So there is this, um, the next slide is, so there are now five, uh, there are now five um, clinical trials going on. The last column we're doing, that's the Biogen clinical trial called REASON. That's the next slide now. So this one is the REASON study, and we're trying to slow kind of the effect, regulate the effect of the LARC2, so that the cell body can regulate itself and discard of the toxins, and then the brain could be a little bit healthier. Uh, this one is directly intrathecal. So for those of you who had epidural shots, uh, you can relate to this. So it's a needle through the back so that it goes directly to the brain. Nothing, it's the, it's the, there's no, it's the shortest route to the brain tissue itself. So, um, so yeah, if you have LARC2, so this is open for people with LARC2 mutation. Uh, if you have LARC2 and you're not shy of getting intrathecal injections, this might be a really good clinical trial for you. It could slow disease progression and it could assist a lot of, of, of folks in the future. So the next one is the freezing, how can we improve freezing in Parkinson's? Freezing is so tough because medications don't work as well, right? We could give a lot of levodopa, it doesn't really work so well. Um, physical therapy is our best chance of unfreezing a Parkinson patient. 
But it kind of is hard to remember to remember to take big steps sometimes. And as we slow, get slow in our thinking, it, it's harder. So how can we do this more automatically? Next slide. So this is a patient who has freezing, if you could press the button. Uh, and I if think you, could cross you guys your hands across your chest can relate to this. Stand up. So, at least good. a lot in this and room. I saw, I saw some of like you guys. start walking out the door. See, something so basic and elementary okay, is best. now so difficult to do. And if we could okay. just unfreeze a patient, I think it would help a lot. Make a left. And then just go Especially straight. going through thresholds, turning around is very difficult. It's embarrassing if you're holding up the line. You know, it's very difficult. Okay, next slide. If you could cross your hands across your chest. Next, next slide. Okay. Yeah, one more. And then try to stay. Okay, so there are a few things we do. Then you could keep pressing. And we have all these cues to kind of help out. Uh, again, if you do this at home, they work. But then your home will be over-decorated and super colorful. Um, and it's hard to kind of always bring those gadgets with you, right? OK, so what are we doing at the clinic? We think that maybe DBS could be a solution for this. Now, we know DBS works. Dr. Walter um, gave you a talk on, on this. It works so well for some, but not for other symptoms. It works really well for tremor, for stiffness, for slowness, for motor fluctuations, but it's not really good for freezing, not as much. What's the reason for this? Well. Our brain waves work in different frequencies. It just so happened that the frequency that the tremor, the stiffness, the slowness require, they're all high frequency. But then the frequency of stimulation that the gate freezing requires is low frequency. So if you go low, they can walk. But then they'll be shaking and they'll be stiff, right? And if you go high, they won't be shaking and they won't be stiff, but then they'll be freezing. So what are we going to do? So next slide. We think we may have found the happy medium. So I want to introduce there. The picture is Dr. James Liao. Uh, he's the newest and probably the smartest member in our team. He's this biomechanical me me uh, engineering genius. And he is thinking that maybe we should alternate the frequency, low, high, low, high, low, high. So the br parts of the brain think that it's stimulated correctly. The other part thinks, I'm OK with this. And we can cut our cake and eat it too. So this is for people who had DBS already and who has the certain type of DBS implantation that can be manipulated high, low, high, low, high, low, and who are freezing. If you're that, if you have DBS and you're freezing, contact Dr. Liao or, or any of the research coordinators, and they'll get you in to in that engage PD trial. So you'll be you'll put a HoloLens which is a virtual reality kind of environment, and you'll have a pretend obstacle course to make you freeze, and then he will alter the frequency of your DBS to see if you walk better with certain frequencies. So this is our attempt to try to alleviate one of the most difficult and burdensome symptoms of Parkinson. The next is this motor fluctuation. What are we doing to make the doses between uh, 
sorry, the doses connect better from one to another. So off time, although there's so many products we can choose, the reality is we're not nearly as good enough as we think in, in here. So this is a study by Michael J. Michael J. Fox Foundation. Over 3,000 Parkinson patients, random, and they were asked, how many times do you have an off episode? And less than 10% had zero. 90% or more had at least one episode. And at least 10 would have four or more episodes per day. So this is a very, very common scenario. Next slide. And you'll see that as you have more years with Parkinson's, you have a higher chance of experiencing these motor fluctuations. And the caregiver burden and personal burden is not a joke, as you know. Okay. And if you ask, what happens when I have an off episode? When you have an off episode, what happens? They can say a lot of things to describe it. They're stiffer, they're more rigid, they can't, they can't walk, they're shaking. But those are just the motor symptoms. Next slide. The non-motor symptoms are even more colorful. They, some of say they can't pee, they can't think, they get panic attacks, they can't talk, and stuff like that. And when the medication kicks in, they're better again. But then it doesn't last, and then they, they experience this over and over. It's very traumatizing. So, um, what's the, oh yeah, so there, just to show that how relevant this still is, there is a survey in Europe, and uh, I know you can't read it. This is a survey of nearly 200 advanced Parkinson patients. Their definition of advanced is um, six years or more of Parkinson's, and the number one complaint they have is motor fluctuations. And even for those below six years with the disease, it's still a top 15 problem. Okay, so it's relevant. What are we doing? So there is this class of drug, I think Dr. Appleby mentioned this in, in, his, in her quiz in the match game, dopamine agonist. For those of you who still remember you were being placed on this at one time, or maybe you're still on it, Mirapex or Premipexol, Ropinirol or Requip, and the patch, Rutigotine or Nupro, those are dopamine agonists. They really work well. And they try to smooth the medications from dose to dose. Um, they have a once a day dosing um, for the brand name. It's three times a day for the generic. So you have a cheaper option, you have a convenient option. And Patients really have less fluctuations, and they're quite powerful. They're quite effective. The problem, we haven't been using it enough because it causes some side effects. The most um, concerning one are these impulse control behavior disorders. You, you heard this gambling, hypersexuality, uh, binge eating, and stuff like that. And that, that can be fairly significant if it happens. It happens less than 10% of the time, but when it does, it could be devastating. Um, it can also cause weight gain and, and stuff like that. So how do we go around this? Well, we believe there are two types of dopamine agonists. There is the D1 and the D2. All the available dopamine agonists, commercially available dopamine agonists, they're D2. And we think that the D2 is the one causing all these side effects. But what if we stimulate D1? You get the benefit, like Cinemat, like dopamine agonist, but you don't get much of the side effect. So we are testing Tavapenon, which is a D1 agonist, and that's the Tempo trial. And so we're looking for Parkinson patients who are either early and ready for treatment, ready to feel better, uh, or already on levodopa, but the duration of effect is falling short. If they want to 
enroll in our dopamine agonist, our tempo trial, you are more than welcome. Please contact our office for this. Next slide. And then the last, and then I'm, I think I'm still on time, is oh, the non-motor. Next slide. So there is more to meet the eye in Parkinson's disease. The G, every organ system, as you could see here, it's so busy because every organ system is affected. And an even bigger challenge is that every patient has a different combination of non-motor symptoms. Okay, next slide. In fact, the way I see this is like, I see Parkinson's like an iceberg. What's visible on top of the iceberg are the motor symptoms. Those are the ones you can see, the tremor, the stiffness, the slowness. But what lurks underneath are these like long lists of non-motor symptoms. The most devastating of which, next slide, are the neuropsychiatric. Cognitive impairment, behavioral impairment, they're the most devastating. But there's more. GI symptoms, sleep, autonomic dysfunction, um, you know, urination, et cetera, et cetera. Too many to address, but we have one. We're trying our best. There is this STEM PD trial. It's an external device that it's like a headset you put and it stimulates brainstem modulation. And brainstem, consider the brainstem like the uh, I-95 of a highway or I-90 when you're crossing from, from uh, east to west. So everything goes there. So if you clear the pathway of I-90, then you have less of these non-motor symptoms. So you wear this headset twice a day. You can even read while waiting for it to work. Um, and hopefully you'll have less non-motor symptoms in Parkinson's. Um, so yeah, we're, anyone having non-motor symptoms, that's, the, that's our project. So those are what I wanted to share. We are offering a lot more, uh, but these are the clinical research and trials we're doing that are addressing the four biggest unmet needs in Parkinson's. Uh, last slide here is, uh, you know, a thank you to my team. I am so proud and honored to be uh, working with just some world-class clinicians. It's such a daily pleasure to be working with them, for them. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I love my job. And I'm sorry if someone wants to take it away because I'm staying for a while um, because I, I just love it so much. Uh, anyways, maybe, maybe not as a boss, but I, I just love seeing my patients, seeing them thrive and be better. Uh, and I want to thank you all for, for staying till the bitter end. There's one more Q&A. Uh, please stay on for 30 minutes and then we'll call it a day. Thank you so much.